Welcome to Guitar Gavel, a place for people who love guitars. These are conversations with musicians, guitar enthusiasts, techs, and collectors about their guitar journey and their love of the instrument. Thanks for tuning in. Please hit the subscribe button, share with your friends, and be sure to sign up for our twice weekly newsletter at guitargavel.com. Hey everybody, welcome to the Kadar Gavel Podcast. I'm your host, David Still, and I want to say thank you for your time. It's your number one asset, and thank you to spend 45 minutes to an hour listening and watching a podcast and watching some killer guitars and hearing from killer guests is a lot. So I just want to say thank you. If you like what you've watched or what you've heard, please give it a thumbs up. Tell your friends, leave a five-star review, ask some questions in the comment section, and we'll we'll get answers to you. My guest today is John Schultz of TrueVintageGuitar.com. And if you're a vintage guitar fan, you probably know who John is. If not, here is your introduction. He's got an amazing story that he is going to share with us today. He's joining us, I love it, from Birmingham. So half my family is from Alabama. My parents went to school in Birmingham, got engaged. And John is one of the um, few Alabamians. And I say this with all due respect to my Alabama brethren. He doesn't necessarily sound like he's from Alabama, but he's from Bama. And by the way, Roll Tide, we didn't even go there, man. Big Alabama fan. That's my team. I went so. to the university, but uh, I don't know if you can tell I'm not a huge football guy. Uh. It's, all good. it's all good. You you know, you're chasing guitars in college and we'll, yeah. we'll hear that story. So, John, I want to say thank you for your time. Thanks for being a guest and, and for spending for however, however long we're going to hang out, man. Really? Thank you. I'm stoked to be here. Thanks so much. I'll tell you what, I just got a notification here that maybe my signal's a little low and I've got a hard wire. So everyone bear with me. I'm just going to plug this in as we transfer over to a legit Ethernet port. There we go. Instead of yeah. Wi-Fi. I should have done that beforehand, but we're jamming now, man. So John, yeah. tell us about like your first guitar experience. When did you start playing? What was your first guitar? Maybe who got you interested or how you got interested and we'll just go from there yeah so i mean my guitar journey is probably not probably not that unique at least the early years of it in that uh just as a kid being around in pop culture and seeing the guitar and thinking well that is the greatest thing that's ever existed clearly um you know just something you know deep was like that we have to we have to be involved with that you know like uh, so i always wanted to play my, my i was one of six kids and you know, everyone enjoyed music, but no one wanted to play it really, except for me. That was just like my deep thing. And of course the guitar was the in instrument that was the coolest thing I've ever heard. And so um, I, I didn't have like the wherewithal to pursue like formal music education. Like I just, I just never, I think I, I played one year of like trumpet in the band as a fifth grader. And I remember I, I could not read. I was like, I, I don't know what those are, but I could just hear it and play it, you know? So I was like, well, I don't have to read, you know? And as, in fifth grade, that's okay. I think anything past fifth grade, that's not okay. So uh, there was never a future as like a formal mm -hmm. musician in that sense. But just my spare time was that's that's what I wanted to do. Um, but w whatever reason, you know, the way I'm wired is I love the music, and that's why I'm there. Yes, of course. But the guitar as a tool and an instrument and as just an item is is what draws me to it is, is, is the guitar and uh, I have to have something to do with it. I like, I want to express this thing and, and that's play music. So like I, I didn't approach the guitar because I loved music. I approached the guitar because that's the coolest thing I've ever seen and uh, end up playing music because I love music and I want to be able to fully experience the guitar really. Um, so for whatever reason, that was me, you know, 10 years old, uh, you know, getting getting my first guitar. And then, um, you know, I, I always loved old things and used things and uh, vintage, you know, uh, I think my, my grandmother who passed away, you know, our last conversation was that we just love old things, you know, and she had this pie safe that she talked about and she loved this pie safe. And, uh, you know, that was, you know, I was talking about guitars and that was our last conversation uh, together. So for whatever reason, that was just old things and guitars were like the two things that I just just found deep within, you know, it just was. And so the, the vintage guitar thing was just like gravity, you know, like the, it was just that's that's where I'm going. Um, 
so I did go to the University of Alabama. Um, and as a freshman, uh, you know, I, I just didn't, I just kind of perused guitars and didn't really know much about them. And then as a sophomore, I had this buddy who was like, you know, I want to upgrade my guitar. And he was looking at Taylor's and stuff. I'm like, yeah, those are cool. But have you ever heard of vintage guitars? Like that's the, you know, he had a budget, you know, I didn't have a budget, <laughs> you know, he had a budget. So I was like, dude, you need to look at like an old Martin, like a D28 or something like that. You, you've got to check that out. So I found this one and it was like a few hours away. I was like, dude, this is a great deal. It was a 72 D28. No, excuse me, D35, a D28 with a three piece rosewood back. So that's Indian rosewood. Nothing terribly collectible about that guitar, but just a quality instrument, um, you know, and I think the seller at that time, this was 2009, he's probably asking like $900 or something like that. And I was like, man, this is, this is you, you know, like you have to buy this. This is, you know, we'll, we'll both drive down there and this would be great. And he's looking at me like, what are you stupid? You know, I was like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, I couldn't figure out what he, he didn't see in this guitar. I was like, it's a great deal. This is like a $1,400 guitar, or a, you know, $1,800 guitar or something like that. And, you know, this, this guy's in Georgia, you know, a couple hours away, like we've got to go do this. And he just wouldn't do it. I was like, okay, you, you can go buy a Taylor and that's great. You know, Taylors are fantastic instruments and fantastic tools for their job in certain scenarios. But, you know, this was like a vintage guitar. We have to do this. So I was like, all right, fine. I'm going to do it. Um, at that, at that time, I was working, uh, you know, my parents were supporting, you know, part of my college education and I was working as a janitor to support the rest of it and it was just super frugal. I was living on my friend's porch. Uh, it was an enclosed porch. So sure. <laughs> it's what you do in college. I, hear. Yeah. <laughs> I was just getting by, you know? Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I was able to get that money together and I rode down there, you know, with my family on like, on their way to somewhere. And we like made this happen, made this deal happen. My brother was there and I get back to it. And I'm just overjoyed. This is the greatest moment ever. You know, we have this vintage guitar. Now it needed a neck reset and it had a couple cracks and the bridge was little <laughs> and the, you know, whatever, whatever, all the, all the stuff that, um, you know, that happens to 72 D 35s. And, but I didn't care. I was like, this is the greatest guitar I've ever touched and um you know I, so a month and a half goes by and i'm like wow i'm really enjoying it i'm looking up you know acoustic guitars all the time and i'm like you know what have you seen those gibsons like those round shoulder southern jumbos and that kind of stuff those look amazing and i was like i think i'm gonna sell this martin and see if i can get enough to get that gibson and so that was my first like you know flip i suppose you could, at that point it was truly a flip in that i didn't do anything to the guitar i didn't have any skills to do anything to the guitar and so I just posted it up on eBay and uh, a guitar shop in France bought it, I think for like 1600 and we shipped it out. They were happy. Every, everybody was great. And I was like, whoa, this is, <laughs> you know, I've never made that kind of money before by doing that. And so it just kind of grew from there and snowballed from there. Um, started out loving acoustic guitars. That was what really drove me 2009 to 2015, 16 kind of transitioned to solid body electric guitars. And so far I haven't looked back, but that's, it's kind of been my journey in a nutshell, I guess. Uh, the um, how many did you flip? Many more guitars during college? Yeah, you graduated what? Yeah. Two thousand. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, graduated two thousand eleven, and cool. um, yeah. So I I I, I did that D D thirty five. Uh, there was a there was a fifties Southern Jumbo, which I look back on now had these unique features. It was like cherry back and sides and this weird rosette. I like need to find that guitar because it was it was very strange. I didn't know it at the time. I was just like, I don't know. It's a 50s Southern Jumbo, greatest thing ever. Um, and so then I moved on to like, I found this little collection of Tweed Fender amps. And those were like the coolest things ever. You know, it's like, I didn't even know hardly how to play an electric guitar. But, you know, it was like, a, it, there was a Champ. There was a, uh, a Deluxe. And... I think there was another, now I can't remember what it was, but anyway, they were in various states of disrepair and, uh, but I love them. And I called this buddy over. I was like, we've got to play these, you know, these, these amps. So we plugged in the champ and the deluxe. And I had like a microphone with a quarter inch cable for like harmonica. And I was playing harmonica, you know, through this amp. And my buddy was playing the Stratocaster he had, 
And uh, no, I'm sorry. My buddy was playing harmonica. I was playing the guitar and I was trying to play something. He was like, oh, you need to play it right here. And he touches the string on the strat. Neither of these amps were grounded. And so he gets like full wall electricity. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, like blew him up uh you know he was totally fine but uh he was not stoked about it um not as excited as i was after that about playing <laughs> uh, you know so sold those on ebay and um was just kind of having the time in my life just you know learning and uh exploring new things and you know new uh different types of the guitar world that I'd never like had access to, but you know, it was like every spare moment was Craigslist, eBay, you know, there was no Facebook marketplace at that time. It was all that. It was like, I'm looking at guitars, you know, I'm going to get these business classes out of the way, but the other time <laughs> we're looking at guitars. Um, it was just like deep, you know, it was just like th that exploration that, uh, was driven by something I can't even really explain. It was, it was just there. Um, you know, felt like gravity in a lot of ways. Um, it just had to happen. Do you, do you think because you were coming on at this time, right? We had the 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 glut in the marketplace, and prices were really inflated. Um, 07, 08, When did it crash? Oh nine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it came it came with the recession. Yeah. Uh, in tandem with that, but I think arguably they were really overpriced vintage guitars to to an extent in that mm -hmm. time period. So do you did you kind of nail it like early on, like prices had come down, or did or may have. Were, or maybe, yeah, um, yeah, I definitely miss the boom and bust of the mid 2000s. Um, like I completely missed that. Um, you know, I was not even vintage guitar aware at that point. And, um, you know, it really wasn't until like 2009, 10, 11, that I kind of started getting active in this place. So I, I have not yet seen that big bust, you know, um, and maybe that'll happen again. Maybe it won't. Um, you know, it's hard to predict that kind of stuff. Yeah. Probably if it does happen again, not in the same way that it happened 2008 or nine. Um, but um, yeah, so so I had a limited budget at that time. So it was very helpful to be in a kind of stagnant marketplace where there wasn't so much competition. You know, people uh, people were getting back to their normal jobs at that point instead of like flipping stuff on eBay and, and whatnot. Um, you know, like so many people were in 2004, five, six, seven, um, you know, there was huge, a huge market there. And I know a lot of friends that did really well during that time period. And then it busted and did less well <laughs> for a couple of years yeah. Yeah. and kind of transitioned into something else. Um, I completely missed that. Sure. Sure. Cool. I mean, that worked out well. I mean, and you yeah. did it the whole time and, and we were able to, to get your hands on some guitars that maybe you would not have been able to yeah. you know, a few years before that. Um, so you're you're going through college you're you're doing the flips on the side for fun i mean it's totally exhilarating you're getting your hands on killer guitars that that you're falling in love with or ones that you had loved previously um and had not been able to to experience before so I, i'm trying to think there's a couple ways we can go here with the questions or what i'm thinking about in my mind um at some point when you decided to to make it a little more formal and yeah to start because somewhere in there you started to learn how to repair and um you, the young guitars and, and amplifiers as well so um, i don't uh yeah uh like i i do a lot of cleaning setup and small stuff but i don't do like refrets crack repair neck reset i send all that stuff off because i have far too much respect for that skill you know like that is a very high level set of skills very rare to do very well you can do a next set but to do it very well every single time consistently is a level of skill i never i'll never get to um i just don't have that you know that's that's not deep here um but yeah i mean so so the way it transitioned into like a business a full-time thing which we never really like we I, I never bought those guitars you know 2009 to 2014 thinking let's build this business you know, i was just like I don't know, this, this is what I'm doing, you know, this is what I wanted to do. And so, you know, I was doing everything cash, no financing. And so that was a slow kind of, you know, snowball into having enough guitars to even go full time. So I graduated 2011, got married. We moved to Nashville because I was like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to be the ultimate guitar god in Nashville, you know, of course. Uh, and so um tried to get a job there with gibson had a couple interviews was like this is it this is me you know um 
nope, uh, did not happen. Um, Gibson didn't have a spot for me, which was which was like brutal at the time. But now I'm very glad that I got to go. They kind of forced me to pursue this one route. Um, yeah, so we had trouble getting jobs in Nashville in 2011. Such was the economy. So I suppose I did hit that bust in, in that <laughs> sense. In that there were, I couldn't find a job. Uh, maybe we didn't spend enough time. But anyway, we moved back to Birmingham and uh, I was working for my dad's company. He owns a commercial cleaning company, which was who I was working for in college as well. That was how the janitor job <laughs> came about. Um, because for the time spent, it was it was decent money for the time spent. Um, and I just didn't have that much time. So uh, he needed a lot of help at the time. So, you know, I kind of came on with him thinking, you know, this will be a sustainable way for him to kind of um, you know, be that business owner and have someone kind of run that stuff for him and then maybe, you know, grow into that business owner, um, which was an exciting kind of thing for me. But it became clear that to be a business owner, you've got to be really passionate about that industry. And I just couldn't find that passion. Um, you know, I know that my dad did. He loved building. He loves building his business. Um, and I love building mine, but I just had no passion for that industry. And so, um, you know, it, it grew to a point where, he needed me less. I needed him less. So it was a really tough thing to be like, dad, I, I got to quit. You know, like that was really hard. Um, but it was the best thing for both of us, you know, looking back. Um, and so it, it just got to a, a difficult point. My wife was like, you've got to go try this guitar thing. You know, we were, <laughs> you know, 24, 25, uh, no kids, just a cheap apartment. And, you know, just being young and having, having really no, you know, responsibilities. And so um, she was totally okay with me going and, and spending a year to see like, what is this an actual profession or is this just like a side thing? You know, um, what even is this? Neither of us knew. Um, and so uh, February two, 2014, I quit that full-time job and just started, started this and um fumbled around in the dark for at least five years um, while we had to build up our, you know, skills and knowledge, you know, which you, you just have to get that from somewhere. And if mm -hmm. Birmingham, Alabama, there's no shops to go work in that have vintage guitars and have skills like that. There were some friends around that had some really great knowledge and who would kind of dabble in vintage, like people that worked at a guitar shop. You know, I have a friend of mine, Keith, who worked at a guitar shop here who would sell all the vintage guitars for the owner of that shop. So he would go to the shows and we would go together to the guitar shows and I would learn so much there. And, um, but you've got to, you've got to build your, uh, your skills and knowledge, which is tough to get because it doesn't really exist. But you also have to build your, uh, just, just level of cash that you're willing to spend on vintage guitars and not on living. You know, it's like mm -hmm. this pile of cash doesn't get spent on rent or you know, eating out or a new car or anything like that. This is only to buy and sell. Um, and, and in order to operate at the level to be able to support a family, that pile has to be really big. So you have to say, I do not want to buy that new car. I do not want to um, buy more clothes, live in a, uh, you know, buy a house, whatever. You know, it's like you, you have to say, those are only for guitars. And you have to have, if you have a spouse involved, they have to be okay with that. You know, so <laughs> I got just yes. blessed and lucky to have a spouse who was 100%, no problem. You know, this is, this is the guitar money and you need to, you need to figure this out, you know? Um, and so she's a high school teacher and supported our, our family for um, five years before we could, you know, actually start paying back into that family budget uh, out of the, the um, true vintage guitar money. But yeah, so like 14, 15, 16 was that kind of, you know, learning. And I, I had had some, some good deals and bad deals and just fine. And it was just like, started becoming clear that like the Craigslist eBay thing was changing. I'm not sure what year Facebook marketplace came in that started mm -hmm. at some point, 16, 17, maybe. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I was on Instagram since 2012. Um, you know, so I was building that kind of audience following and community there and uh, just kind of growing and reinvesting. We re reinvested everything, every single dollar you know, 14 to 19, except for our down payment on our house in 2016, which we're incredibly glad with that we did in 2016 compared to house prices now. Um, but other than that, everything was reinvested uh, until like 2020 at some point, I believe. Um, and that was kind of the point where there was a little bit of a turning to where, you know, 
it, 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 if you want to make a, a job out of buying and selling vintage guitars, you have to be able to make like a five figure investment at the click of a button, just like, boom, we got, we got to have that one, you know, like, uh, so that just takes, you know, that, that takes a lot of just cash specifically allocated for that only. Um, so that just took a long time to build up the way that we wanted to do it, which was no bank financing, um, mostly out of fear of, or, do we have enough skills to have that kind of money? You know, it's like, I wanted the money and the skills to grow at the same rate. So uh, we chose the slow route, <laughs> which feels great now. We're glad that we did that, but uh, it was very slow, um, you know, 14 to 2020. Um, so yeah, that was kind of how it grew. But yeah, but you went, you did it smartly. And thanks. I mean, I, th I think that's, that's, that's how you learn. Uh, had, had you yeah. had a friend and family loan or a bank loan, it, your journey would look different and it may not be, yeah. have, have been as fruitful. So yeah. I do kind of, while we're talking about the business, I, I would be interested in kind of hearing the model. Like, um, are you buying to flip? Are you buying to build your collection? Are you buying for, are you representing discrete buyers that are secretive and, and you're just handling it for them? Share a little bit of what you can, you know, as to, to how it's evolved to this point and how you're operating. And then if you've got ideas, you know, about what, what it's going to look like five years from now, I would love to hear that as well. I'm sure everyone would. Yeah. Um, yeah. So at the moment, um, you know, what, what drive, what drove this whole thing to start with was just the love of this, like, uh, you know, world of vintage guitars that, uh, it existed elsewhere. I could never even touch it. You know, like I had no idea where it was or what it was, but I just had to figure it out. Um, in order to own those guitars, you either have to be professional musician, doctor, lawyer, you know, you have to have a very high income earning potential or <laughs> be a vintage guitar dealer. So that was my, that was my bar of entry is like, you know, in order to get to experience these, I'm going to have to be in the industry, you know, um, you know, providing value to people. Um, and so, um, so, so yeah, like I am perfectly happy buying and selling and getting to have those guitars for a time, getting to inspect them, getting to photograph them inside and out, getting to learn about them and then moving them on to the next buyer. Uh, like I'm, I'm happy there. Like I don't have to have uh, my own private collection. Um, I do have like uh, my own like collection that I, I tell a lot of people I have like three piles of guitars. I have the guitars that will never get sold very small because you have to sink your money into it and then it's gone. You know, right. if you're going to die with that guitar, that money's gone forever. Yeah. Um, and so then I have another pile that's like, well, these will get sold eventually, but not right now. You know, it's like, this is what I'm really enjoying. It's what's really, you know, sparking that passion. And then I have the section of guitars that is currently for sale. Um, so those you'll see on my website in the all current inventory section. It's pretty small right now. I started out 2020 with like 20, 25 guitars. Wow. I think there are 10 there now. Um, it was down to like seven. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it was like that, that pile is small just because it's tough to like, yeah, the, the sales were happening so quickly, but um, yeah. So, so uh, as, as far as like, uh, you know, how does that work? I, I buy all of these 99% with that pool of money that, that I talked about that was built from, you know, 14 to 2020, um, except for like very few, um, like the uh, 1958 Les Paul standard I got in South Africa, uh, you know, six figure guitar stuff to keep that money parked somewhere. And, uh, you know, so that was help that that was partially financed by, uh, by the buyer, which was Joe Bonamassa. So Joe and I had done some deals before, and I can talk more about this story later, but basically we funded as much of that purchase as we could. We put every dollar into that guitar. It was like bank account was down to, you know, very small, smallest it's been since we started to, in order to fund that purchase. And then he, he fronted the difference and then bought me out of the rest of that. So that's very rare for me. I, I don't normally do that. Um, most of the guitars I deal in are 10 to eighty thousand dollars and those are all bought with with my money and i own them until they're sold um which is which is how i'd like to do it you know um it, it means like i have to take on that risk for myself so um like I, i'm not doing a lot of consignment at the moment those don't make me as excited um they're they're not 
my guitars, you know, the, the one guitar I have on consignment at the moment was my guitar. You know, I, yeah. I, I bought that one, sold it to that person. They're now selling it. So that's how that consignment happened. Probably we'll do more consignment later and we'll figure out a way that, that really helps that, that seller and stuff. But for right now, while I'm operating out of the house, they're all privately owned, um, by me. So, um, that's how I'd like to do it. Um, sorry, I, I, I got lost on that train of thought and, uh, you're good. Yeah. You're good. Uh, I was just kind of the, the follow up to that was no, you, you answered the, the question completely. Do you, are you thinking about the model four or five, six years from now? Or are you just yeah. living in the moment? Oh yeah. yeah. It's a great time. Um, so you know, we've basically grown out of this room in my house, which, you know, looks like this at the moment, it's a total wreck. Um, but this huge rack of guitars. And then on the other side is a total mess that I'm not going to show on video, but, uh, <laughs> It's, it's completely spilling out into the hallway. It has just outgrown the one room in our house that we were you know, able to devote to it. And so we did buy a, um, a condo unit in downtown Birmingham, uh, right now a couple of different cool venues uh, where a lot of bands come to play. And uh, I'm going to kind of transition it into like, one thing we were talking about before we started the show is that, um, you know, making money is great and that's fantastic, but at, at what sacrifice, you know, I don't want to sacrifice my like family life, you know, quality of life outside of work. Um, so when it's here, it's always here, you know, it's always in my head. There is always more I could be doing, you know, there is no more, there, there is no like limit. You you've bought this many guitars and now you're done that, you know, that doesn't exist. Right. So, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the more I, the more I work, the, the more enjoyment I can have and the more money I can make. Right. So it's really hard to cut myself off. Um, and it, it just feels like it fills my head all the time. And so I want to be with my two-year-old son when I'm with my two-year-old son and he's not ready to play guitars yet. So, <laughs> you know, so, uh, we bought this condo unit downtown Birmingham. We're working on the build out now. Um, half of it is going to be like a studio style showroom where all the guitars are out, all the amps are out, all the pedals, all the space echoes, that kind of stuff. Um, those are going to be out and ready for you to mix and match and plug and play. Um, so I want people to be able to come in and put their hands on the guitars, enjoy them, get to touch stuff that they could never have otherwise accessed. Um, you know, like, like me in 2009 when, uh, you know, I couldn't just like randomly drive to Nashville and, you know, go to Groon or something like that. Uh, cause I had stuff to do here at a job. And, um, and so, uh, you know, Birmingham doesn't, doesn't yet have that. So. I want to grow into being that resource for Birmingham and anyone traveling through. Um, I know it will be a slow start because we don't have employees yet. So it's not going to be like, a, um, you know, open 10 to five yet. It's going to be by appointment, but we want to grow into that. Like I don't want vintage guitars to be inaccessible to everyone. And, and that's why I really focus on like photography as part of this job too. I'm not a professional photographer, but I do try to learn as much as I can. And so that I can share that, those like minute details of vintage guitars through photography to, to where like you can access that all over the world. Like let's say you live in India, you love custom color Fender guitars, but you're scared to buy one. Cause it's like, I'm not sure what it should look like. I'm not a vintage guitar expert. I want you to be able to go to my website and pull up the 1965 Fender Jazz Master and candy apple red, scroll through the first couple of pictures, get to like deep in the pictures in the back and you can see neck pocket, nail holes, uh, backs of the pickups, solder joints, uh, potentiometer codes. I want you to be able to see all of that in the photography. So I want to access you there over the computer. And then I want you to be able to access those if you can come by in Birmingham, Alabama. I can't be every year. I can't, you know, provide the guitars everywhere all at once, but I can do it here. Um, and excited to get that separation from, uh, you know, home life and work life, um, right. you know, because it, I do have kind of a obsessive personality about this thing. I, it ends up taking up my headspace outside of when it should. And I, yeah. I want to be with my family then who's maybe less, not quite as excited about vintage guitars as I am. Um, and maybe my son will be at some point and maybe he won't. I don't know. I want to leave him that space to like decide that for himself. Right now we're looking pretty good this morning. He was talking daddy's guitar, you know, so like, <laughs> talking about, um, you know, daddy's guitar. So maybe, maybe that will happen. Maybe it won't. Yeah. That's super um, great. Can I piggyback on that for a minute? Yeah. John? Um, your idea of, of the concept for, for the, for the condo, 
you know, I, I live in Boone, North Carolina, for those that are unfamiliar with Boone, but it's home of Appalachian State. It's, it's Raleigh is, is three hours away, a little less. Charlotte's just two hours away. And it's, depending on how you go, it's, it can be a pass through to Tennessee, a pass through to Knoxville on your way to Nashville. Um, and we have, it's the home of Doc Watson. Luke Combs went to App State. If you're a country fan, Eric Church went to App State. Um, Old Crow Medicine Show used to busk downtown until yeah. Doc Watson discovered them. Uh, there, there's a couple more band, uh, Rainbow Kitten Surprise. There's like yeah. the Netflix dudes that play <laughs> that got their own following. Um, so there, it's it's a big music area, and and it's a cool place for people to stop over in their journey for bands to stop over. Going along with your location in Birmingham, you can build a destination. If you build it, they will come. You're not too far from Nashville. You're not too far from Atlanta. Um, you're not too far from from Memphis. You've got some of the greatest southern cities and, and music cities on the face of the earth, uh, you know, just within a couple of hours. And just floating this out there. And my guess is because our minds are, are are thinking along the same lines, man, like a destination for a band that's playing in Birmingham, like to know you're there. You've established some relationships over the years for them to come hang out, check out your collection, tell them, yeah. you know, and play after the show or the day before or the day of and tell their friends. Dude, you're onto something, man. I it makes it. me really excited. Um, you know, for for that type of person who's just dropped into Birmingham, you know, what do we want to show of our city? It's not New York or Los Angeles, let's be honest. Uh, but we can bring our own thing, uh, and so this is what I want to to try to bring. Um, but also for that for that kid who is in college and thought about vintage guitars, and like, I think if if uh, if we want like you know, people to enjoy and love vintage guitars, they have to know about them. And so yeah. if you can't know about them, you're not going to love them. And so I want you to know about them. And I want you to have held one and make that decision for yourself. Whoa, this 58 Strat is $44,000. And it does not sound like a $44,000 guitar. That's totally fine. Like, that's fine with me. I want you to decide that for yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't have to prove anything to you. I love them. And that's why I have them. I just want you to be able to experience it too. Um, you know, uh, I, I have more like thoughts on that point, um, but I want you to be able to make that decision for yourself. And you're not going to be able to if you can't get to them or if you don't know about them. Um, so I, I try to want to I really would like to to make that a thing for people, you know, in Alabama or Birmingham or passing through to be able to experience those. Um, so yeah, the uh, accessibility and I know it's not it's not your intention, but but a byproduct of the accessibility is you are, I mean, you alluded to it, you are building future customers too, right? You're building yeah, future yeah. vintage guitar enthusiasts, whether they're mm -hmm. ever a customer, but they they love it like you, you're helping facilitate that love or, or their introduction to love at first sight. I mean, it's it's all there, dude, it's beautiful. So poetic. Yeah, that's what Groon and, and Carter and Rumble Seat have done. Uh, and I, of course, stand on the shoulders of giants, you know, that, uh, you know, Groon, of course, essentially starting the industry and, yeah. you know, uh, holding that shop in Nashville for forever, you know, having bought that real estate in downtown Nashville in like what the 70s way to go, uh, <laughs> you know, number one, uh, but also curating just this vibe and, you know, amazing love of vintage guitars. Walter Carter, same thing, um, you know, Rumble Seat, all that stuff. Uh, yeah, I'll never be that level but i feel like i can bring my own thing um and so that's that's what i like to do i hear uh, i love the modesty i've learned one thing in my my years is never say never so we'll just leave it at that <laughs> and, and, and and stay modest but never say never um <laughs> all right so and we've got some guitars we're going to look at I, I want to you know what why don't let's just jump in i've got some other questions but like you want to do it? You want to show off some guitars? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. okay, so so yeah. one thing that kind of coincides with showing off one of these guitars. Okay, thank you. you had a question. <laughs> yeah, you had a question um, on, on this email. I'm going to go back to it um, yeah. uh, and, and look for that question. It was, um, craziest story of success and disappointment. Yes. Um, because, like, you know, if you are a a small business owner, or if you buy and sell vintage guitars on the side just for fun, like in your spare time, it's emotional. Like you feel when you you lost that EBA auction, or you you should have paid more, you should have paid less, or you know you. It's like uh, you feel it deep more than like um, more than you should. It like it's it really doesn't affect you that badly, but in your you know um in your heart you feel it so badly and so the, the successes and disappointments there's so many on both sides 
Uh, I mean, probably greatest success is that story of South Africa, that 58 less ball burst, you know, where, uh, I, you know, I was representing Joe, you know, which is, which is rare for me, but uh, you know, Joe, <laughs> you know, he's such a passionate buyer, easy to work with just the nicest guy ever. Uh, we were just overjoyed when we were the high bidders for that guitar. I actually went to South Africa. It took me 40 hours to get there. Um, well, maybe it was 38 to get there, 40 hours to get back. Anyway, so like, you know, we, we actually go to South Africa, which was how we were able to be the high bidders. It's like, we were, we're going to go there. Like, and this was March, 2020. So, um, excuse me, no, March, 2021 when, uh, so this is one year into COVID really February, 2021 when the negotiation was happening. But, um, you know, so this was when the South Africa variant was like the deal, you know, this is before we had, like, oh, man, yes. Yes. so I'm thinking I have a two, I have a one-year-old, you know, about to be one-year-old. I'm about to go to the place with the variant that we worry about at that time. Um, but I was like, this has to be done. You know, like, <laughs> um, this was, I had to work to, you know, so we did go there, uh, bought the guitar, drained our entire bank account to do so. Um, and, uh, and then on my second to last day, uh, my return flight was canceled by, uh, the Dutch government. Cause I was connecting in the Netherlands and I texted Joe. I was like, dude, I think I'm stuck here. <laughs> like he was like, just book another flight today. Charge me the bill. Get out now. You know, like go. Yeah, you've got to get out. So uh, I booked a same day flight connecting through Doha, Qatar um, to Philadelphia. So that took 40 hours to get all the way back. Um, but anyway, so huge success for there. Um, lots of disappointments. Uh, also, one that happened recently and comes into the guitar that I wanted to show you. Also from 1958, my favorite year for solid body electric Gibson guitars, uh, 57, 58. Uh, is that right on that transition from where the Les Paul standard goes from the gold top to the burst, you have fresh introduction of uh, patent applied for humbucking pickups. That was when this like lightning strike of the burst, you know, 1958 to 1960, single cut maple top. Uh, that was when that happened. Uh, and so 58 is like one of the most exciting year for me. So I wanted to show this one, which is not yet available. It might be sold. I'm not sure yet. I did just get it um, from Milwaukee a couple weeks ago, um, and it is a 1958 Les Paul Custom. Um, pull it out here. Oh, there it is. I just got it back from the repair shop. Today, it didn't need much. Um, just a couple of maintenance things. Someone had um, roughly replaced the nut. Um, this piece here, it was the incorrect material and they did a terrible job. It looked ugly, but I had a Les Paul junior from 1961 that had some issues, some change parts, and it had the correct nut on it, correct, like shape and everything. And while like transplanting parts is not how I want to do this thing in this moment, I felt like we've got an otherwise excellent example of the Les Paul custom from 1958. All it needs is that nut. This other guitar is not all original. Many parts have been changed. So we transplanted this nut, um, or I asked my luthier too, uh, and he just did a spectacular job uh, on that. But otherwise, fantastic guitar. The thing about the custom, you know, you've got a 58 Les Paul standard, you know, $300,000, $350,000. <laughs> you know, the difference, the difference between the Les Paul custom and the standard during that time period, of course, the black finish, um, you know, the, the, the Les Paul standard has the maple cap, whereas the custom is mahogany all the way through. But the biggest thing that I think makes the custom like a eighty dollars to $100,000 guitar instead of a $350,000 guitar is the fact that it has this extra pickup here. Um, it, it's funny, if they had just left this pickup off, <laughs> you know, like uh, that, would, that would be a, a more valuable guitar. You kind of run into like the spacing for where your pick goes. You kind of have to set the pickups right, number one. Also, they wired it very strangely in that we've got a three position switch, neck pickup, bridge pickup, but the middle position is not intuitive. It's actually the middle pickup and the bridge pickup, but they're out of phase, out of phase from each other. So you get that kind of thinner, quacky tone, um, you know, Peter Green, Les Paul tone, but you can't control the amount of phase cancellation with the volume knobs like you can on a two pickup guitar because... Uh, the middle position is controlled by a single volume and tone. So 
um it's kind of a it's kind of a funny thing it's like that was something they did very much on purpose because it was kind of popular in the late 1950s that kind of like thin and quacky out of phase tone whereas today we would say hmm, not quite as popular <laughs> it doesn't sound quite as good as a standard middle position on a two pickup guitar um so in order to like make this play like a burst uh you know you'd have to break the solder on this cover swap the magnet around then you'd have an in phase middle position and it really just it doesn't make sense to have this extra pickup um, so that brings me to the, the big, uh, uh, it's not, it wasn't a failure. It, it just wasn't a success, uh, recently where, um, two, three months ago, I got a call from this guy and a typical story, you know, grandfather passed away. He had this whole guitar. We were looking at, for information on it. Um, and it is a 1958 Les Paul custom. It's not this guitar. Um, so he sends me pictures. And I'm like, a jaw drops because it was a two pickup Les Paul Custom. Um, so very rare did this happen. Gibson Factory made them with only two pickups. And the middle position is generally in phase, I believe. I've never actually held one because there's only like 10 or 20. Um, but, you know, mahogany body all the way through, but just a two pickup Les Paul Custom. Very rare variation. And my like guitar nerd heart just is like... Oh, I have to have that, you know, it's like, I will pay whatever, you know, and so I tell him, I'm like, this is very special because of this. I make what I thought was this very strong offer, you know, yes, I'll make money on this, but you're gonna have a hard time beating this offer, you know, so he's in New Mexico. And he's like, Okay, sure. Great. Let's do it. I'm like, all right, great. You know, so we get set up. Uh, I was gonna fly out that day. because I was like, I'm not missing this. I'm not letting him call someone else we're going, you know, it was like, we we're locking this guitar down. And so, uh, it was Friday. Uh, we get set up for a Saturday morning meeting at the Wells Fargo in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He had to drive in from the desert about two hours to meet me there. Um, I noticed later in the day on Friday, after I booked my flight, he goes quiet. I don't hear from him. I'm like, Hey dude, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Meeting the, you know, meeting you and playing this guitar. No word. I'm like, uh Oh, so I talked to my wife. And like, I don't know what's happening here, but this, this feels weird. You know, normally when we're talking this kind of money, you know, a lot of money, uh, people respond. Y you can text back, you know, like when we're only less than 24 hours out from a deal, usually you hear from people. So I get this weird vibe and I'm like, I'm not sure I need to go, you know, like I've already paid for this ticket. I can't come back, but I don't want to spend the next 24 hours, you know, 48 hours of my life going on this wild goose chase for no one to show up. I was like, it doesn't matter. I'll never have a shot to buy one of these again. So I'll be so mad at myself if I don't just go. Uh, Albuquerque is a connection, so it takes half a day to get there. So I fly out that afternoon and fly into Albuquerque, get there late that night. Next morning, show up at the Wells Fargo at 9 a.m. Nobody's there. You know, so I was like, ah, you got to be kidding me. You know, it's like it was a $1,500 last minute flight. In order to fly guitars back home, you have to book a first class ticket uh, because the rule is they'll let you get on the plane with that guitar um, as your special item um, only if there's room. So if there's room in the overhead, you're good. Um, you know, if there's room in the coat closet, you're good. The only way to guarantee that, because a lot of these flights are like small regional jets, tiny overheads. The only way to guarantee it is by being the first person on the plane, first couple people on the plane, because then you know there's room on the plane. Uh, so you have to buy a first class ticket. So it was expensive. So it was 1500 bucks. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, it's Saturday morning, 9am. I wait till 945. I'm like, all right, this guy's not showing up, you know, like this is not happening. So I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna go find him. It's like, we're not letting this go. Like <laughs> this is we were too close to this. I'm not letting this go. So I drove two hours out into the um, northwest corner of New Mexico. Amazing country, like beautiful, just desert scenes everywhere. I'm loving it because I had never really been out there before. Um, I had no reason to go out into like random New Mexico. Uh, you know, I've been through Albuquerque, but it was different to be like way out there. So I get there on, you know, noon and I'm going through white pages for every listing I can find for this guy. And I had also noticed in my research, uh, as I was in the airport the night before, that there was a 
there was a news story about some nefarious behavior from this guy. Uh, it was someone matching the same name and in a similar area. And I'm like, oh, this is getting this is getting weird, you know? And I was like, it could be the same name. It was kind of a commonish sounding name. We don't really know. Anyway, so I go to a trailer park. Nobody's there. I go to another trailer park. Nobody's there. I'm like, this may be a mistake. Uh, you know, I spend the next 48 hours driving around in the desert. Um, which, by the way, amazing tacos in the uh, in the desert of New Mexico. So if yes. you're like a street taco kind of person, you got to go there. I mean, amazing. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it was worth it for the taco um, the taco visits. But uh, I also noticed in this tiny town in New Mexico that their police station is closed from Friday to Monday. Uh, so by the time I realized he wasn't showing up at 9:45 and thought. I wonder if something's happened here. I wonder if someone's reported the stolen. I couldn't call. So I spent the, the whole day going through every address I could find. I even stopped on the side of the road because I saw this sign for this company that I had seen through Facebook his brother used to work at. So I stopped on the side of the road. There's a guy there. He's in a truck. And I'm like, hey, man, have you ever heard of this guy? And he's like, no, but I've heard of his brother. I'm like, oh, yeah. And I like name his brother because I had like done this kind of <laughs> research to try to find these people. And he's like, yeah, uh, what, why? And I tell him exact. I tell him the whole story. And he's like, wow, that's that's something. I can't believe you came all this way. Uh, and he's like, well, I think I'm friends on Facebook with the brother. So, uh, you know, this is Saturday afternoon. I'm like, oh, we're getting close, you know, like the brother. And so he Facebook calls the brother and the brother is like, I don't talk to that guy anymore. He's bad news. I'm like, Oh, he's like, I don't know where my brother is. I don't care. You know, it's a sad story. Uh, but it's also like, uh Oh, this may have been the same person as the police report, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, dead end there, it, but he did name an uncle. He was like, maybe you should go talk to this uncle. So I was like, well, where's the uncle? And he quotes this address. I'm like, all right, I get in the car. I drive to the uncle. Nobody there. Old address. But I go back to the white pages. I look up the uncle's name. I find the whole family tree. And I find another address. So I show up there. Another trailer park. Go to the trailer and knock on the door. I talk to this uncle for an hour. And he's like, yeah, man, we're estranged from this nephew. He's had some trouble. And, you know, our family didn't have a guitar. So... I don't know what you're talking about, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, this is, you know, so likely to be stolen, you know, it's like, this is, but I'm already here, you know, so I go back home, I'm like, dejected, you know, I'm like in the hotel room, just like, you know, what am I doing? <laughs> Why am I doing this? <laughs> you know, and um, I think to myself, okay, I have one side of the family tree locked down, but there's another side of the family tree, you know, I, I think it was the mom's side, but he is, he'd been using his mom's um, last name, uh, what I didn't know. He'd been using his mom's last name. He didn't know who his dad was. So the next morning, I didn't know that at that time, I was looking around for another another family which didn't exist. Um, so uh, <laughs> by the end of the day, I just like, I, it got to be about 3.45 on Sunday. And I was like, all right, it's time to call it. Not only can I not find him, but it's probably stolen. You know, like he would have called back. And, and even I was going through this thing in my head. I was like, let's say it, even, it is stolen. Wouldn't he want to hawk that to me as, as fast as he could? Yeah. What is happening? I can't. I couldn't figure it out. So my flight is um, Monday uh, at noon. Go back to Al Albuquerque on Sunday. Just enjoy myself. I went in front of the car wash from Breaking Bad because I loved Breaking Bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, took, took a selfie in front of the car wash. So that was fun. And then uh, 8 a.m. Monday morning, I'm at the coffee shop like, Anytime I'm not doing guitars, I love coffee. So that it was just good coffee shop. So, um, you know, it's like 8 a.m. I'm calling that police station. They pick up. I'm trying to get to the person to talk to about like stolen items. I get to this one person. I'm like, yeah, see, I told her the whole story. It's like, I was buying this guitar, but I think it might be stolen. Have you had anyone reported a 1958 Les Paul Custom stolen? And they're like, no. You know, do you have the serial number? And I'm like, yeah. So I quote them the serial number. And uh, they're like, nope, nobody reported it stolen. And my mind is like blown. I was like, no, that can't be true. Why did this guy not show up? You know, if he got a better offer, I, I hear you. Get as much as you can. 
but you'd think he'd play that off of me. Like, yeah. I have a better offer now. Will you yeah. pay more? You know? And so mm -hmm. I, was, I was going through, I was going around and around. I was like, I cannot figure out what happened here, but I can go to sleep at night knowing that no stone was unturned. We did every last thing we could to the best of our ability to try to come home with this guitar, you know, uh, as endless budget, you know, endless time. We, we gave it all and couldn't close, couldn't do it. So I get to the airport, I'm talking to a buddy on the phone and I get a phone call from an Albuquerque area code. It's 1130, I'm about to board, board the flight. And I, I'm like, I need to go. I need to figure out what this is. You know, is this is the guy, you know, I was like, I was like, I'm about to run out of the airport. Like, <laughs> you know? And so it was uh, Dorinda Chi, Officer Dorinda Chi of the um, Bloomfield, New Mexico Police Force. And she said, hi, are you, are you John? Did you call about a guitar? And I was like, yes, I did. And she's like, well, uh, we did find a report about a stolen guitar that matches that description. I'm like, wow, okay, we have something here. You know, we have something to go off of. So I give them everything. You know, I, I tell the whole story, you know, and it, it they're like, yeah, black guitar. We don't have the serial number. So that's why it didn't come up. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, there's a lot of black Les Pauls. You know, I was like, Maybe this isn't it, but she's very sure that it's the same one. I'm like, okay, well, I gave them everything, who it was, phone number, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. And she's just taking down the information. She's like, okay, so how much were you going to pay? So I tell her the number and she's like, oh, <laughs> like, wait a second. <laughs> you know, like, I was like, yeah, that's why I'm here. It's like, this is this kind of guitar. This is this kind of value. And she's like, well, the the person who reported it stole it and said it was worth only 4000 I was like, different guitar, you know, like, no, yeah, they knew, you know, like, uh, another part of the story that I forgot here on Saturday, I ended up at a music shop and I tell them, have you seen this guitar? And they're like, yeah, I saw that in 2014. And I was like, whoa, you know, like, so, so I knew that he had, this owner had brought into a music shop 2014. They also didn't know what it was worth then, but the guy told them like, this was very valuable. They knew it was worth more than 4000 So when the police officer said, this is only a $4,000 guitar, I'm like, different guitar. This guy knows, you know, it's a valuable guitar. And she's very convinced it's the same one. I'm like, okay, you know, whatever. So I give her everything. I board the flight to go home. I'm like, all right, if we're going to close this guitar, which we know exists, and it's probably stolen, where are we going to find it? You know, how, what are they going to do? I was like, well, they're going to try to hawk it again. So mm -hmm. I was like, well, they know that I was out there because I texted, emailed everything. Like, I'm here. <laughs> you know, like, if you want money, come here. So I was like, they're not going to call me. They might call, you know, someone else. And so I thought about who they might call. Came up with a list of three people, reached out to them, told them. Two weeks later, one of them calls me. He's like, hey, is this the guitar? It's the guitar. And I'm like, oh, my God, that is that is the guitar. You know, we have a serial number. We have everything. Same guitar. I'm like, who is selling it? Is it this guy? And, she, and he's like, no, it's a, it's a woman, you know, same or a different story was, uh, you know, uh, like antique shop, some kind of story like that. So, uh, so with the help of that dealer, we kind of set up a little sting with the police department yes. of Bloomfield, yes. New Mexico. And a week later they recovered. Wow. Um, yeah. So, um, police uh took her into custody we found out in the interim that the reason the guy didn't show up is because police picked him up about 15 minutes after our phone call um so he was in jail officer dorinda chi failed to mention that on the phone to me which i think was screwed up but whatever you know like <laughs> um so yeah, for whatever reason when they found him they did not find the guitar because it was with the girlfriend who also had some history so um anyway we repatriated it back to it to its uh, correct owner. I spoke with him on the phone. I told him everything what happened. And I told him what the guitar was worth. And he was like, whoa, I had no idea. And I'm like, how did you have no idea? <laughs> you know, like, and so I'm like, all right, man, do you want to sell? He says, no. I'm like, okay. Uh, you just found out, <laughs> you know, it was worth multiples and multiples on top of what it was. I was like, okay, how are you going to insure it? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I was like, well, I can't make you sell it. So, you know, that's that was the end of that. So the two pickup Les Paul custom in New Mexico eluded me despite my best efforts. But I ended up buying this one with three pickups that I'm very happy with um, about a month later. So um, that's the story of a, of a defeat. Um, but 
not not truly a defeat. I mean, we didn't like uh, buy a stolen guitar. That would be uh, a true defeat. So um, would. you actually ended up just doing a ton of good. I mean, goodwill. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, everything about it is it's just a beautiful story. I mean, man, it, it and you never know. The the owner may come back around. And Maybe. Then, yeah, say, John, you know what? I've reconsidered. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was enough to make someone reconsider at the moment. Um, but uh, I would agree. Yeah. I, I love that the guitar was that special to him, that it wasn't, it didn't matter, you know, half a million dollars, okay. whatever. Well, I didn't yeah. offer half a million dollars, but even if it was, you know, like yeah. it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah, I got the feeling that it didn't matter if it was a half million, million, million five. Who cares? You know, this is my guitar. This is my guitar that I got from my dad. And, um, you know, so uh, even though someone had just kicked in his door and stolen it from him and he had no insurance on it, he was not willing to turn it into money, which I thought was kind of that didn't make sense to me. But you know. with you, yeah, I would I would think along those same lines. And you did him a, a ton of goodwill getting yeah. the guitar back to him. Like you uncovered it. I mean, you were the, you yeah. did the detective work. But nonetheless, I mean, it's just it's the way life goes. You did you did all the right things. And yeah. it, it, it's not that you're looking for payoff later anyways, but normally those good deeds don't go unnoticed and come back. Yeah. Around. Yeah. 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 And you know, if you average out those risks over a bunch of transactions, uh, you know, usually that's not what happens. I've done a lot of like wild goose chases of people that stopped answering and shown up at their door and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, let's do the deal. You mm -hmm. know, like uh, that that's happened. You know, I remember one specifically was a, a, a 57 Stratocaster and it was in Ohio and uh, we start talking about it. It takes two weeks to come to a deal. And I'm like, great, you know, tomorrow I'm going to leave and I'm going to drive the 10 hours. And I'm going to meet you there. I'm going to pick up a couple of guitars on my way back. At three in the morning, he texts me and he's like, yeah, man, I got to go to the hospital, family member. Everything's fine. All right, bye. Uh, you know, just like we're not doing this deal. And I was like, oh, no, but like family member in the hospital, you know, we're talking about family life, you know, that kind of stuff. I was like, you got to you got to take care of you. So. The two other guitars that I'd set up on the way back, I was like, well, I'm just going to do the trip backwards. And maybe in two days, they'll be out of the hospital. We'll be able to do this deal. You know, so I picked up a 1960 uh, SG Special on the way in Virginia. And then uh, I picked up a 57 Telecaster. And um, well, where was it? Yeah, somewhere around there. It got, got kind of what state I was in got kind of fuzzy. Um, and so those two deals went great. And I was like, wow, well, this, this trip ended up being worth it, you know, for, for that. And then the next day I was like, well, I'm a couple hours from that guy's town and I'm just going to show up and sit in the parking lot until he answers. So, uh, I, I drive there and, you know, this was two days after the hospital trip and, um, I text and call no answer. So I'm like, okay. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to jump on Instagram and show off these guitars and talk about them. And it's fun to see that, like, on the guitar safari, you know, talk about the, these are fresh off the pick. You know, those are the ones that, like, really get me going or the ones, like, um, that have just come from someone's house who wasn't a collector. They just inherited it. You know, like, this was an unknown guitar. It's not on the Internet anywhere. There's no serial number tracking. You know, this is the first that the guitar collectors, including myself, have seen it. I love being the one that like gets to show it to everybody, you know, like that gets me going like to no end. And so I'm showing everybody on Instagram about the Telecaster and, you know, talking about features. And then I get this phone call and it's the guy with the 57 Strat. And he's like, Hey man, are you here? I was like, yeah, man, I'm down the street in the parking lot. Um, I just figured, you know, I didn't want to bother you if you're, if someone's not feeling well, you know, but I figured if, if maybe it was convenient enough for you, you could show it to me. And I've, got cash here. So if you want to do the deal, then we can, I'm ready to make it happen. He was like, oh, okay. Meet me at the bank in 30 minutes. I'm like, great. <laughs> so, uh, so we did, and we did that deal and you know, it didn't cost him any time, you know, 30 minutes in the bank is all it, all it cost him. And so, um, yeah, you know, it's like that usually when I roll the dice like that, it, it works out. Um, sometimes it doesn't New Mexico one. It didn't, um, you know, so uh, but if I do that enough times, you know, I'll be able to sleep at night knowing that like, uh, you know, I can tell my son, like I pursued this thing at the highest level I could. And if it didn't pay off, then that's just how it worked, you know? Um, so that's how I'd like to do the whole thing. I'd like to do it the hard way. Um, even though that might cost me in some ways. Um, yeah, man, but no, no test, no testimony. Yeah. Right? 
Yeah, I mean that's. Yeah. Oh, what 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 great! And I love the little the strategy you picked up on some strategy along the way, like you yeah. know how to reroute, maybe generate some interest, catch see if he's checking social media and and, and follow this. That's that's really it's really yeah. yes. Yeah, you know, it just feel like sometimes um, sellers like that. It is less of a money thing. It is a very emotional thing. Um, the the bottom line number is not that important as just the whole thing. And so maybe he saw someone that was so passionate about that guitar, his granddad's guitar, that they were willing to drive twenty hours, even if they weren't guaranteed to come home with it. You know, like there's there's that amount that maybe he saw that and he was like, all right, this guy, this is my guy. You know, like that expression of the deep passion that goes beyond uh, the money side. Because I think the, the the dealer has an uphill battle to buy guitars from private sellers because the private seller does not know that accessing a retail buyer is work. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if it's a $25,000 guitar, then I should sell for $25,000 and that's it. They don't know that they're what, what goes into developing the trust of that buyer who's willing to pay $25,000. It might take a decade of time. Um, and what do they want to know about it? What do they want to see? How are they going to get it? They don't want to drive 20 hours for sure. <laughs> they want to click the button and it shows up at their door the next day. That's what that's what that retail buyer wants. And in order to make that happen, you have to have that infrastructure together. Um, so um, if that private seller doesn't has never done it before and so doesn't know it exists and that you have to have that in order, generally have to have that in order to access a retail buyer. Um, so sometimes it's very helpful to be able to show an expression of the work that goes involved to that seller to, to be able to make them feel like this is the right selling scenario for me. Um, you know, so. Yeah. There, there's a, when it's a, when it's a family heirloom or a deceased spouse's instrument or your dad or your mom or whatever it is, I mean, there's just so many connections to it, even though the seller may realize it's doing them no good and could deteriorate within their possession. There's so much sentimental value attached. So as, yeah. as you build that trust as the buyer, um, it's super important. And you, the way you've documented your journey and the way that you explain right. what you do, where they can visibly see it on the internet, yeah. goes a long way. They know they just, you build that, you, you show up with credibility and trustworthiness out of the gate, even though there's still layers on top of that, mm -hmm. but you already have that built in. It's really yeah, really definitely look for ways um, to to try to establish uh, to to try to humanize it um, because when you're on two sides of a negotiating table, it does become kind of impersonal, you know. And that's just that's just how it works. Someone has to come up with a number, and then that person decides whether that's a good idea or not, you know. Like, and um, usually I'm the one that has the responsibility of coming up with the number that I think makes sense for them. Um, so it has to, it, like, like if your goal is to buy it for as little as possible, you're going to be disappointed a lot because nobody wants that. You know what they, you need to know very specifically how much are they going to sell it for if they sell it privately on eBay and be able to be just above that. You know, like, uh, you know, we, we, we want to be their highest offer. I want to be my buyer's highest offer. And I want, I want them to have to not incur risk or do the work to be a dealer because that's the value I'm bringing to you. Like I'm bringing to you that private seller who doesn't know about vintage guitars. I'm bringing that access to the market and taking care of that retail infrastructure that you don't probably don't have since you never sold a guitar before. Um, you know, uh, and then offer that same thing to the buyer. Um, you know, my, my buyers want to know if you're buying a 53 Telecaster, what's original, what's not, um, what, what's been done. Uh, and you can say, I think this is original but you can also prove it in pictures. Like this is what we need to see in order to, to say it's an original finish. So if we get to that point, if we've got that 53 teller and we see the nail holes and we see the edges of the cavities and we see the solder joints, we see everything like that. You know, there's only two things that can be true. Either this is a factory original 53 or Telecaster or someone has made it who has such a high level of knowledge and craftsmanship. Like the bar is so high to be able to really do that. Um, you know, uh, it probably wouldn't have been sold by that guy, you know, to me at, at what was maybe wholesale, it'd be sold, sold at that retail value. So it becomes, those two things can't really exist, you know? So, um, so yeah, that's kind of my goal is to bring that value to both the seller and the buyer in that way. Um, you know, and then hope to support my family through that. So, um, of course. 
John, do you have any other guitars you want to show off? Or is it, yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't. There's so many. Okay. One that I'm really excited about right now. Yeah. Um, I've got a bunch here. Uh, one is a, a, <laughs> We're gonna a, have to do a, a two a version two, man. Yeah, I think so. One is a, a, um, a 54 strat that is like the very cool rare version of it. And I love that guitar. I want to talk about it, but the one that is really like consuming my headspace as you asked me, what about the next one is, um, is not that one. It is a 1960, um, Gibson Les Paul special, um, in original, uh, you know, the TV yellow finish. Um, very, very clean. Here it is. Wow. Yeah. Very clean. I see that shiny, crispy finish from 1960. Yeah. No neck repairs, no breaks. You know, this one has a uh, pretty fragile neck joint um, just by the design of the neck pickup uh, right in there in the neck joint. Uh, but this one is just as clean as it gets um but that's not really what makes it very special to me um one thing that's cool is it has its original um uh tissue paper uh, hard to see there that yeah one. man how cool yes wow yeah the yeah. tissue paper that the guitar came in from the factory um but what, what makes this one really special um was contacted by the uh son-in-law of its original owner and he was saying you know my dad uh, is is moving to an assisted living home. He's got some memory issues, or my father-in-law, um, and he's got this guitar, and we want to sell it. So I had to identify it, come up with a value, come up with the number I pay for it, and how do we make this deal happen? And he's like, you know, uh, he's got some memory issues, so we don't want to just let him loose selling his guitar, but we also don't want to not involve him in this transaction. You know, it is his guitar, um, you know, and and you know he deserves to be honored in that way. You know, I don't want to take this deal from him, you know, I want him to be as involved as he wants to. Um, and so we're, you know, dealing with inheritance, there, dealing with, um, you know, just age and watching a parent, um, you know, become that age where they need to be, need to be helped. So um, anyway, I went through that with the son-in-law and then they were going to be driving through Birmingham, Alabama to, to take him to Florida, which where he was going to be in that assisted living home. So, um, they we get set up a few weeks later they show up in an rv and so the son-in-law comes up we check out the guitar it looks amazing i talked to him about all the little features and we look at it inside and out i'm like great here's the numbers here that how they break down i had charts and like printed out numbers and here's why you know i want to pay this much um he's like all right that sounds good let's go talk to my father-in-law and you know we're gonna let him make that decision I'm like great so there's kind of like a pre-decision before i got to the father-in-law and then you know <clears throat> which was probably how, um, you know, uh, he would want it anyway. So we got there, we start talking, I present him the charts. I'm like, here's what I believe it's worth. Here's what I think you could sell it for. If you wanted to ship it and do all that stuff, here's what I'm going to pay for it. And here's why, here's why so we get through all that stuff. And, you know, you could tell he's thinking, and I, I couldn't really tell he had memory issues at that moment, but, um, we start talking about the story of the guitar. Cause that's always like interesting why did you pick this one? You know, what music were you listening to? That's the kind of stuff I want to know. You know, why did you buy this and not a standard or not a junior or not a Telecaster, or, you know, something like that. And then he mentions he was in the Navy and we were talking about that. And he was like, yeah, that guitar was with me in the submarine um, during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And I was like, <laughs> like, what? And then I'm like, oh, wait, there's memory issues here. Let's <laughs> Sounds so good. Wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. so, so in the room, in the RV, we have, you know, the son-in-law, the wife, the daughter. So I'm kind of glancing around like, wow, that's a really neat story. Can you corroborate this? <laughs> you know, like, can anyone help out? And they're like, you know, we start going through years. I'm like, okay, what year did you get this? And what year were you in the submarine? And like, he's sharp on that stuff. Um, it's more the recent stuff, you know, where less sharp, but, and, and I'm, I'm incredulous because I'm like, I don't think the Navy is going to be cool with you. You're boarding the submarine to go to, you know, uh, what would become the Cuban Missile Crisis. And you're trying to walk on with your electric guitar, right? I see them saying, absolutely not. And I'm like, so I'm I'm skeptical. But we, I, I kind of grill him on it. Like, are you absolutely sure? He's like, yes, this is my guitar. I bought him this year. All the years lined up. Um, and, and, and I went and posted about it on Instagram and told the story. 
And I was, I said, like, I was like, I can't corroborate this, that this was on the submarine. It sounds like a crazy story to me, but that's what he said, you know? And then this guy messages back. He was like, Hey, I'm in the Navy. You know, I'm enlisted on submarines. There's actually a ton of room in submarines to store that kind of stuff. And you get your own like bin that you can put whatever you want in. And that would certainly have fit. And so like, no, we don't have, we don't know for sure. We don't have document picture documentation of this guitar being on the submarine during the Cuban missile crisis. But at this point, I'm feeling pretty confident for myself. And, and this is in that middle pile where it's like, this won't be sold now. You know, it might be sold eventually. But right now, like, uh, that just, you know, I'm not an expert on the Cuban Missile Crisis. But as far as I know, the closest to the end of the world we've been to, where there were three Russian submarine captains deciding whether or not to hit the nuke button. And one of them said no. And this guitar was, you know, half a mile away from that decision uh, in a submarine. That completely melted me down and blew me up inside. Like that nuclear bomb went off. I, I was that third captain blowing that, you know, like nuclear bomb off in my head because just the gravity of what happened there. Um, is, you can't understate the gravity of what happened there. Uh, and, and this guitar was there. So um, that completely blew my mind, um, you know, so uh and to get to buy it from the person who was there and have him tell me about that was a unique experience. I think a lot of people don't get, I'd love for you to be able to get that, but I also want to be able to buy that guitar for myself. Right. Right. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> I mean, you know, we were talking before and what draws most people to vintage guitars, generally speaking is, a, is the heart and soul of the guitar and how it carries a piece of the heart and soul of its previous owners or it's one owner or it's 20. It's the story. And then it's the story that you don't know that you want to daydream and envision and, and romance around. Like I'm going to create the journey for this guitar, <clears throat> even though it's in my mind, that's going to be one of the reasons why I love it among the other reasons. But that story changed sounds to me as you're telling it, like changed all the dynamics about the purchase and the, yeah. the guitar and where you're, like you said, your headspace and, and how it's swarmed this guitar, because if it was just, yeah, I just kept it in a case and it, I got it from my yeah, fill in the blank. You know, those stories. Yeah. It changes your relationship to what's in your hands right now. Yeah, I think it goes back to that. Like when I was talking earlier about if you pick up a 58 Strat and you don't know anything about vintage guitars and you see the forty four thousand dollar price tag and you're like, who, what idiot is going to pay that, you know, for a guitar? You know, um, I think if we compare it to an old car, let's say. Let's say, you know, an, an old a 58 Corvette. If you compare a 58 Corvette to a 2023, you know, new mid-engine Corvette, <laughs> the 2023 Corvette is going to blow the doors off of anything, anything made 10 years ago, you know, 50 years ago, especially, you know? So like, well, should we even love the 58 Corvette? Absolutely. Are you kidding me? Have you even looked at it? That is what the, the new one is based off of. The guitar thing is is even more different than that because... The guitars we're playing now based off of this and they want to be this, you know, like uh, you may play this and find that tone wise and playability and feel that it does blow the doors off like a new one. Uh, I wouldn't know because I don't have any like new guitars or custom shop or anything like that. I, I don't know how they compare. So uh, I'm sure they're fantastic instruments, um, but like what it is, is also part of its value. Um, also what it does. But what it is, 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 you know, this young um, submarine, uh, you know, enlisted guy's prized possession that he brought to him to what was almost the end of the world. So <laughs> what I don't ask, because it's one thing that I fantasize about with with vintage guitars. You said what it is, what it does. And another component for me on that is what it can do. Not maybe with me playing it, or the answer yeah, is definitely not true. with me playing it, but what someone else can do. And that is another component to the mystique and to the love um, for me. Yeah. I don't know if you experienced that as well. But. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, as you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier that I play guitar because the tool itself drives my heart and passion like, like nothing else. And I like music. And, I, and I, I would say that I love music, but not so much that I can read music and be a professional musician. That's not in, 
th that wasn't me. That was never going to be, um, you know, uh, I had something different to bring to what I thought was the music world. And, and that was this love of the instrument and, and uh, inside and out. Um, and so what it is, feeds into that uh you know if i was just not just sorry <laughs> if i was a professional musician and that was you know the greatest guitar in the, in, in the world and i picked up two guitars i might not care about what it is i'm only worried about what it does but as someone who loves the item and like how they made things and that you know what it is is like a huge part of its value so yeah yeah, yeah. super cool man um all right so we, we, I'm laughing to myself because we kind of talked about time and I mean, we could go all afternoon and I, and, and you've yeah. got to stop here in a few minutes and really, all right, someone put you on the record and be like, can we do this again? Can we just like, maybe yeah. enough when we just like fire through some guitars, like yes. you just line them up, dude, and just start, I yeah. still tell the story, but like, let's burn through them. Um, I, but I've got one or two, let's see, um, uh, kind of a, a couple questions. Bucket yeah. list guitar, like what? What are you looking for, man? For for oh, your personal collection. I started writing that down earlier today, and it got so long. One thing that's on the list that I've never owned is a Karina Gibson, so an Explorer or a Flying a Flying V, a late fifties Explorer or Flying V. You've only got like one hundred and eighty chances to do that, even in nineteen fifty eight. So, like, <laughs> I'm not convinced that's ever going to happen. But I have owned guitars, even Gibson guitars, that are more rare than that. And uh, you know, one of them, which was next on the list, is the um, the spruce top double necks that Gibson made from 1958 to 1961 or two. And those are like totally unique in the Gibson world in that they are fully hollow, but they're very thin and they have a carved spruce top that has beveled edges like an SG, but a laminated maple back and then four humbucking pickups. Um, so they are completely unique in construction amongst Gibson guitars. And, um, like the wood construction is totally different, but also the electronics are totally different in that you have two necks. Yes. So you can do, you know, a 12 string or six string or whatever, but you've also got a wiring difference where there is a toggle switch for, for each neck. So two, you know, two separate ones. And then one in the middle that is also a three position switch where you can have bottom neck, top neck, or both on. And that is where you get a completely unique thing among Gibson guitars, where if you want to do like, vibey hipster ambient swell stuff that's the way to do it because you turn both on you turn the top one uh volume all the way up um and then you turn the bottom one volume all the way down you play the bottom one and the stuff that comes out of the top is just just like a, on a different plane of reality it's totally different um so that's like tons of fun but also just as you're playing it as a standard six string guitar, it's completely unique. It doesn't sound like a Les Paul. It doesn't sound like a 335. It's this like very wide, rich frequency response that is just different. I, I, I don't know. So I was lucky enough to buy one of those, um, you know, in, in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. It was a 1959 Gibson EDS 1275, so a six and a 12. Um, unbelievable guitar, uh, of which there were 15 made that year maybe 10 or 15 the year before 10 or 15 a year after you know there's just the uh, for, uh, for the actual six and 12s i think there were 46. um so there's you know maybe 40 or 50 of the like six and the short six the mandolin next and like maybe a couple like with the banjo and like some weird stuff but of the six and 12 there's about 46 chances ever to have gotten one of those um and so to be privileged to have owned one of those for uh eight months was I never could have guessed it, you know, it just completely blew my mind, but I want to, I want to buy another one of those and, and own that for a period of time. That makes sense uh, for my family. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, for the family. We get, <laughs> we yeah. get it totally. Okay. Last question. And then I want you to please, uh, after this plug your website, your social media channels, how people can reach out to you. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you have an ex extensive knowledge and a lot of that is personal research uh in in school of hard knocks over the last 15 years plus yeah some of it yeah <laughs> do, you have, do you have any recommended book reads that have that have helped accelerate your knowledge or that you found yes. uh, yeah i'm coming left field man we're going from yes. guitar to books i did not gather those together i wish that i had um but basically all the just um andre just passed away in the past year i think um french collector 
who wrote uh, books on like the Telecaster and the Stratocaster that go into such depth that uh, if you like those small details, you gotta you gotta check out the Dishes Wild books. Um, but so many, uh, so many like weird out of print books. I um, was super lucky to find on eBay. Uh, there, there's this book by Larry Miners called the Gibson Shipment Totals book um, uh, from 1937 to 1979. And that goes through, is supposed to have go, gone through all of the Gibson shipment records and totaled up how many beach models shipped in each year. Um, it's not 100%. It's probably wrong in a lot of places, but it's the best we've got. And it seems to line up with collectability. Like why? Like, okay. So a Les Paul Jr. and a Les Paul TV model are two separate models, but the only difference is the color of the finish. Like if we take a 57 Les Paul TV model in the TV yellow finish that we know of compared to a 57 Les Paul Jr., same single cut body, no binding, no inlay, um, you know, single P90. They're the exact same thing. Gibson called the two different models and even broke them down into different is in uh, production totals. So why would a junior be worth so much less than a TV model? Like if you see a junior at $10,000, you'll see a TV model at 20. Is it really that much more valuable? Like why would that be? And that's because there's like maybe like five or six times the amount of juniors compared to TV models. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't know that if we didn't have this production book. Um, but if you go out there and like look at the market, market it matches that production totals book. The market doesn't care what's in the book. It just is. Um, so, you know, there's fun things to, to to find in that book. I was able to buy 10 new old stock copies on eBay one time. Um, and I have promised to give those away. I have yet to do it because only because I don't have the right mailers. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to give those away. I haven't done it yet. Sorry to those people. I promised you. I could give one or two away just putting them in boxes with guitars but i have many more of those to give out um so that's a fun book hopefully it will come back into production or maybe something else by maybe gibson that would be nice mm -hmm. uh, yes. since they have those documents be yes. nice to have um you know <laughs> from the from the horse's mouth um yes yeah, so many great uh oh, I, I wish i'd written down my thoughts no, no, okay um, yeah we, we, hey we can always circle back and, and i can yeah. add that to the, to the note section of the podcast yeah. Um, all right. So lastly, how people can find you, we mentioned the website, mentioned again, Instagram, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, so it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking to buy guitars, uh, that trueventageguitar.com has everything that's available right now. Uh, and you can click the button that'll show up at your door the next day. Uh, free overnight shipping. Killer, right? Well, sorry, uh, to, to, the, to the United States. I can't do it overnight internationally because there isn't that option yet. But show up in two or three days outside of the United States depending on the country. So um, if you want to buy, that's the best place to do it. Um, if you want to follow the journey of the guitar safaris and like, um, you know, stories about, you know, you know, trips and, uh, you know, little unique things about guitars, Instagram is kind of where I found a lot of people want to see that. Uh, I did try YouTube for a while, really enjoyed it. But um, the time necessary to devote to those YouTube videos got, got ahead of me. So mm -hmm. I've kind of abandoned that for now. Hopefully I'll go back to that. Uh, but, uh, if you're on the Instagram platform, uh, love to, love to connect there. Uh, true vintage guitar is the Instagram handle. So perfect, man, John, yeah. this has been an absolute blast. What a pleasure. Thank yeah. you so, so much for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoyed yeah. it, David. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is a blast. I want to do it again. I wish I had connected my thoughts a little easier and <laughs> it, was, but, uh, it, was, it was beautiful. Trust me. Um, yeah. this was absolutely perfect. So you're on the hook for 2.0 where we'll like shuffle yeah. through some guitars and hear some more stories. Yeah. Hold on one second. I'm going to double click us out. If you'll, if you'll hang back and we'll chat for a minute as we wrap things up for everyone that's um, listen and watch. Thank you so much for your time as well. I know you've enjoyed yeah. John's stories and seeing some of his guitars. We'll do it again. Thanks so much, everybody for tuning in. Really appreciate your time and we are out. Thanks for tuning in to the Guitar Gavel Podcast and a special thanks to Steve Kuykendall for composing this music and being such the great guy and friend that you are. As a reminder, hit the subscribe button and sign up for our twice weekly newsletter at guitargavel.com.